Uh, good morning, this is Larry Stovall, and I'm with uh, Harlan Baptist Church. This is the Sunday School lesson for the Ambassador Sunday School class. Harlan Baptist Church is located in Walter Hill, of course. I'm glad you're with us this morning, and we're, going, we're again uh, taking up our study in the book of Hebrews. Our lesson for today is in Hebrews chapter 9. Now, we have been kind of spread out over the last few weeks and over the last few months because of of the virus and it looks like lord willing that the, the end is in sight there so hopefully we'll be able to pick up the pace a little bit but today we're we're going to look at hebrews chapter 9. now by way of review uh we looked at the book of hebrews is written uh with some some unusual characteristics for other books in the bible first of all we do not really know who wrote the book we do not, and since we don't know exactly who wrote it, we do not know exactly when it was written. But we do think that the, because of the writing style and a number of other different things, if you recall, uh, we believe that the Apostle Paul wrote this book and we don't, uh, the scope of this, uh, of this lesson is not broad enough to cover that, uh, that debate because that's an ongoing debate. But uh, personally, I think the Apostle Paul wrote it just simply because of the writing style. We think that it was written uh, around 53 to 70 AD uh, because we know that Timothy was uh, saved and added to the church somewhere around 53 AD and he is mentioned in the book of Hebrews. And we also know that the the Jewish temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So, and that is not mentioned in the book of Hebrews, which I think that it would have been. So we know that it, we think is written somewhere in that time frame. First of all, we, as a review of the book, I know that if you've been watching them online, you probably have this up to date, but since there's been a, a little bit of time elapsed since that, and just simply for my uh, purposes, I like to go back and recount the book thus far. We know that in chapter one, the, and the, the book is written for, to, the, to the Hebrews that are members of the church. We know that the church is now about 50 somewhat years old. We know that Paul is, uh, was born in 5 AD. We, we think that uh, the church is around uh, uh, 50, 25 to, to 30 years old. And then Paul is around 50 to 60 years old, somewhere in that range. So we know that, uh, that uh, by this time, the, the new had worn off. And so a lot of these Jewish people who were uh, members of the church uh, may have been, and kind of the, 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 the tenor of the book is that the writer is sp reaching out to these people who are Jewish members to saying, hey, don't abandon the church. Uh, don't go back to the way that you were raised. This is a, this is a better way. And so with that in mind, the writer sets out to prove to the Jewish members of the church that, uh, it, that Jesus is a better way. We know then that uh, in chapter one, the writer presents Jesus as a Jewish Messiah and the completion of God's revelation and is superior to the angels. That's book one, chapter one. Chapter two, his, there's a warning to the Jews at that time uh, not to not to miss the salvation and don't reject this better way, this new way uh, that they're not accustomed to and go back to their old standard and our way of living. And of course, we understand that there's a number of reasons why the Jews were trying to go back. First of all, man, been because of the persecution uh, of the church and the persecution of them and, they, and a person who had lived this way and were being persecuted by by their family and by people they know said may have decided hey this is not what i want so i'm 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 going to go back to the way the way it was and so i'll be accepted by my family uh they there was a prejudice against their jewish uh, against their gentile members of the church uh the gentiles were not cultured in the same way that the jews were cultured uh they had, the gentiles had habits and uh, and, and things that were obnoxious and offensive to the Jews. And so they may not have wanted to be around that. And then there's a passion for their culture. I mean, their whole life they'd been raised in this, uh, this atmosphere of the Jewish temple and uh, that way of life. And now they're out of that and they're on the outside and they miss that. So they may want to go back. 
So in chapter 2, he's warning them not to miss this. Chapter 3, he says that Christ is superior to Moses and the law. And in chapter 4, he talks about the danger of unbelief. And he, talk, he compared that to the Jewish nation in the wilderness. He said that this was God's rest. And so therefore, they missed God's rest because of unbelief. Chapter 5, we know that uh, the writer presents the case that Jesus is superior to the Aaronic priesthood or the Levitical priesthood, uh, the, the descendants of Aaron. We know then that the, in chapter 6, the Jews are scolding for being immature and warned that Christ once received, there's no backing out, there's no turning back. In chapter 7, he talks about the importance of Melchizedek and we remember that Melchizedek was the king of Salem, and this was that Abraham, he knew Abraham, and in Psalms 110, it, the Messiah is uh, prophesied to be a, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, and so since Melchizedek was this king of Salem, and so when Aaron when Aaron had gone and rescued the, the, uh, his uh, nephew Lot and had, had plundered the kings, he came back to this king of Salem, which was Melchizedek. And of course, Salem is, the new, is Jerusalem or the new Salem. And so this king, uh, Abraham uh, gave a tithe to. And so the fact that Abraham uh, tithed to Melchizedek meant that Abraham uh, admitted and was saying that Melchizedek was superior to him. And therefore, anything that descended from Abraham was also uh, inferior to this, this uh, high priest Melchizedek. And Jesus, of course, is prophesied to be after the order of Melchizedek. Chapter 8, there's a summary of all of these things. And he brings up this old covenant. And the old covenant, of course, is an agreement that uh, God made with Moses through the Levitical law. And so this covenant, this contract, if you will, a covenant is another word for contract. If we today in, are dealing in legal issues and we enter into a covenant, actually what we're doing is we're entering into a contract. And so we know then that this contract, and so because of Jeremiah 31, 1, it is predicted that the old covenant will be done away with by the Messiah. And so the writer of Hebrews here said that the, this covenant will re be replaced by a new covenant. Now, there are two different kinds of covenant that we need to consider when we're thinking about this. The first is an, a conditional uh, covenant. An example of this would be the covenant that God made with, a, with Adam in the garden. He said, Adam, you can stay in the garden and you can be whatever you want to be. As long as you don't eat, you can eat of any tree in the garden, but don't eat of this one tree, which is uh, the knowledge of good and evil. And of course, uh, Adam being a typical human being, couldn't, couldn't uh, being led by his wife, uh, he broke that covenant. And as a result of that, was rejected from the, from, the, uh, from the garden. We see then later that God makes a covenant with Abraham and he tells Abraham is to get to remove himself from his homeland and that he will show, go, take him to a place that he's going to show him and that, that land will be his forever. And it doesn't matter the conditions. So the Jews, though they failed him many times, this covenant is still in place. This is an unconditional covenant. And so we look then at the old covenant. He tells Moses, as long as the people uh, keep this contract, keep this covenant and keep the, my commandments, then I will be their God and they will be my people. But it's dependent upon them keeping the commandments of the law. And of course, this covenant was a conditional covenant, which has been set aside by the new covenant, which is under Jesus Christ, which is an unconditional covenant. Because it says in Romans, it says that the, that the callings of God, the calling is without repentance. And so we look at that and we see then that, uh, that this then he's describing today that the first covenant, the old covenant that was made with Moses is set aside and the new covenant takes its place. 
And in chapter nine, uh, the writer describes the process that's going on. So we gotta understand that that means that a person who accepts Christ as a savior is an unconditional uh, is an unconditional acceptance. That doesn't mean that a person's free to do whatever they want to. It does mean, however, that God will not, uh, will not uh, reject their salvation because they do something right. We were not saved because we did something, uh, 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 we were not condemned to hell because we did something wrong because we were born in sin after the similitude of Adam but we were we accepted this as a free will we accepted christ and there's without uh, without we did nothing to receive it except to receive it god extended the invitation and we received it and as a result we'll not lose it you say well that's that's kind of uh doesn't make sense uh well there you mean to tell me that if i sin that god's not going to take my salvation that's exactly right then it means that I, if I do sin, that there's no consequences. No, I didn't say that. There are a lot of things that occur, but the, the loss and the breaking of the covenant is not an option. God may take you home under that covenant early. He may kill you to keep you from being a stumbling block to others, but that's a uh, source for another day. That's called a sin unto death. And so, but it does not mean that a person who commits that sin will die and go to hell. So if we look here, then chapter nine, we're gonna look at the covenants. Now, for a covenant to take place, the covenant must be accepted. It must be signed. And so once we look at this, and we looked at those different covenants, so we're gonna to look today at this new covenant that Jesus Christ brings uh, to bear, and the old covenant, which was under the law of Moses, and we're gonna compare the two. And what the writer of Hebrews does in chapter nine is that he compares the writing of the, he compares the, the old covenant to the promises of the new covenant. So the first thing we're gonna do, we, let's go to Hebrews chapter nine and we're gonna read the first nine verses. Normally I do a verse by verse, but I think because of the length of the chapter and because of the difficulty, and the amount of information here that we're gonna to have to kind of skim the top of it a little bit. I, I apologize to you, it would, it would take us several weeks to cover this in depth. But what I wanna do is kind of summarize as we go through, as the writer has done here, and let's look then in chapter nine, verse one. And the writer says, then verily the first covenant, that's the covenant under Moses and under the law, also ordinances of divine service, and a world and a worldly sanctuary. Then verily the first verse one. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. He's talking about the law of Moses. There was a tabernacle made, and the first was a candlestick and a table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. After the second veil of the ta of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was a certain gold pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And over the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now, when these things were ordained, the priests went always first to the tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God, but unto the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he had offered himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way of the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing, which was, now the tabernacle, it says, which was a figure. This is a prophecy a picture, a figure of the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make, could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to conscience. So let's look and, 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 and let's back up a little bit. And so I, I'm gonna go back through here. I've got notes here, but what I think I'm going to do here is I'm gonna just kind of read down through the verses. And let's, let's kind of talk about these verses as we go. He says the first covenant then was a, a, an ordinance that was set up. 
and it had a divine order of service. There was a whole bunch of laws that were given and a practice of which these Jews were very familiar with. For there was a tabernacle. Now the tabernacle, there were two uh, vessels of worship, both built pretty much the same. The tabernacle was first, it was a tent and it was built with, uh, with the court and with the curtain without and then it had in the middle of it the Holy of Holies and all of this different furniture that sat within this, this uh, tabernacle. Now, of course, Jesus, the covenant is not in a building. The Bible tells us that, th that Jesus, the tabernacle of God is in the church. And of course the church are his people. So therefore these, this, this tabernacle is literally describing you and describing me as a part of this, uh, of God's relationship to us. And now later on, the tabernacle was put away and the temple took over. And there was, was built after the order of the tabernacle, except it was a permanent structure. But if we look at the tabernacle, what this is, is that we have a body here on this earth. And if you haven't figured it out yet, this body is a temporary temple, is a temporary building. It's portable, it moves around, but in heaven, there is a temple, there is a permanent body that will, will, will serve the same function as our body here on this earth, other than the fact that it's a permanent tabern temple and the tabernacle is temporary. So if we look here, the tabernacle was made first and in that tabernacle, there was a candlestick. The candlestick then is a symbol the candlestick is a symbol of the light of God that shines within a person's uh, soul. And the table and the showbread, which is a symbol of God's relationship to us. All of these things were made so that we could actually, that we could actually see this as an example of things that go on. So if we look here then, then he says within the second veil, which is inside the soul of us, there was a uh, the tabernacle as the holiest of holies. And this is the place where God wants to dwell in our heart. And in this holy of holy, there was a golden censer. There was a, there was a place and the Ark of the Covenant. Now the Ark of the Covenant represented the, the, the presence with God, the, with the presence of God. The golden censer then is a, is a basin wherein that you can look at things and things are reflected uh, that you can see and, and, and examine you. And so as we look here, this Holy of Holies is a symbol of God's presence inside of us. Now in this presence was the Ark of the Covenant. And this was the Ark of the Covenant, which was made with gold and there were cherubims on top. And the wings of each of these cherubims came to a point in the center of it over the mercy seat. And so once a year, the high priest took blood from the, from the sacrifices and came in and sprinkled it on the, on the mercy seat. Now, this is not a picture of baptism. This is a picture of God, of Jesus Christ saving us and, 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 uh, and, and taking uh, and purifying our, whole, our, our body and our soul. And so we look here, then the, these things were ordained and the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. Only one person is allowed inside this, this temple, this Holy of Holies. And that of course is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is this high priest uh, of this earthly tabernacle that, which is our body and which is us. And to the second went the priest once every year without blood, for it was all for himself for the errors of the people. So it talks about then that this then is a symbol of us. Every person has a threefold being. We're created in the image of God. We have a soul which no one has ever seen. And this soul resides in our body. And so we know that inside our body, this soul represents the Holy of Holies, the central part of us. We have a spirit. And so this spirit is symbolized by the lighted candles and the high priest entering in and leaving into this Holy of Holies. And then we have a body, which was the tabernacle itself in person. Now then we moved here and we talk about then the, the cleansing verses 10 through 15. We talk about the cleansing 
of the Passover lamb. This is symbolized by the sacrifice of animals. Now the writer of Hebrews here is making the case that the, the sacrifice of Jesus, who was the perfect Passover lamb, is much more than the symbol of these, uh, of these sacrifices that are made in the temple. The writer of Hebrews is saying that Jesus is superior to this. Now let's look at verse 10 and see what it says. Which only stood in the meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed of him. Let's back up again to verse 9. And he talks about which was a figure. Uh, and this tabernacle was a figure in which we offered both gifts and sacrifices. They could not make him that did the serpent perfect as pertaining to the conscience. In other words, these sacrifices did not make a person pure. Uh, only Jesus and only the blood of, of Christ can make these pure. Then he goes to verse 10 and he talks about this and he talks about the parallel of the old covenant and the new covenant. The old covenant, he said, which stood for meats and drinks and divers and different washings and carnal ordinances. This was the old, order, old covenant imposed on them under the time of reformation. But Christ being the high priest of good things, the new covenant to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building. In other words, this building is this, this new covenant is on a personal level with, the, with a Christian himself and with the church. And the church then are made up of a body of number of people who group together and under, this, uh, under this salvation by Jesus. Uh, so he talks about here in verse 12, neither by the blood of goats in the old covenant and calves, in the old covenant, neither by the blood of goats and calves, verse 12, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained a personal, uh, eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bull and goats and ashes of the old covenant and of a heifer sprinkled in the un, uh, sprinkling the unclean sacrifice sacri sufficeth to purify the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God? purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death of redemption and transgressions that were under the First Testament, they are called, their call might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So what he's saying here, and there's a, this, the, the, the language gets a little bit involved, but basically what he's saying is, if the sacrifice in the tabernacle has meant so much under the old covenant for all these years to you. How much more will this personal sacrifice of Jesus Christ, God himself, be to, 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 to us who are saved and to us who are members of the church? And so remember the writing of the, of the book of Hebrews is making a plea for the Jews, Jewish members of the church, not to depart from the church as a whole. So we look here and we see the, the life of Christ and the life of Christ uh, uh, is, is according to the Old Testament. Now, we know of a pretty good certainty that Jesus was not born on Christmas day as, as we celebrate it. And I, I don't want to, to burst anybody's bubble uh, and I have no problems with sacrificing his birth on Jesus's day because we also we sacrifice his his birthday on Easter, which would uh, uh, would be on a Passover day as well. So I like to, I like having two days to sacrifice the birth and the resurrection of Christ. However, we got to understand that Jesus was likely born on Passover uh, during the Passover. Everything of his significance in Jesus's life happened around Passover. Now, Passover, of course, was a celebration of the children of Israel uh, when they were in captivity to Egypt and Moses and, and had put Pharaoh and God had put Pharaoh through the, 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 the 10 plagues. And finally, uh, the last plague is coming and Pharaoh finally relents and releases the people. 
And we know that what happened was that the night of the Passover, when the death angel moved through Egypt, anybody that, that the, all the children took their animal and uh, their, their, their sacrifice, this Passover lamb, and they, they, it was a lamb without spot or blemish, and they executed it, they drained its blood, they caught its blood in a, in, in a container, they took a hassock, which was wool, and on a stick, and so they went outside the doorpost, and they struck this, this blood over, over their doorpost. Now, this Passover lamb is, is everything that the tabernacle is based upon. This, this whole process began with this. And so Jesus Christ then, when he came and he, he was born at Passover, he was the Passover lamb. And when he died, he also died on Passover. And so we know then that this Passover lamb, when the death angel came through and he saw the blood, he passed over those individuals. And so we know then that this is what got it started. Jesus is a fulfillment of that prophecy. And I've, I've intended to do this in part of my Bible study now. I'm going back through and I'm looking at all the different things of Jesus around Jesus' life that happened on Passover. And it's the feeding of the 5,000, for example, occurred uh, on Passover. Just about every major event in Jesus' life occurred around Passover. We know that the cleansing of the temple was around Passover. And so all of these things, because Jesus was a fulfillment of the old Passover, the old covenant, ending the old relationship and starting the new relationship, the new covenant that God has with him. The first covenant was that, was that the sacrifice of animals could not make the people clean, but the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins indwells our, our body in the Holy Spirit and our body is all grouped together in an assembly, make up the church, which is the new covenant. This is an unconditional covenant that lasts forever. Then we go to verse 16. For there is a testament that must also of necessity, uh, of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood, for when Moses had spoken every precept to the people, according to the law, he took the blood of calves of goats and of water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the testament which God enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. For therefore, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things of the heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself and now appear in the presence of God for us. So we look here and have you ever heard this, this comment? This is the last will and testament. And so this is, this is the illusion that the writer of Hebrews is making here uh, to these Jewish people. He talks about that, <clears throat> that the, the practices in the Old Testament was a picture or a figure of the coming testament or the testator. And so verse 16 says that, that the New Testament will not, be, will not be viable unless first the testator or the per person dies and then the will and the testament are then in force. For example, uh, a few years back, Darlene and I went to a lawyer, and so we wrote out our last will and testament. And this testament uh, where we, we uh, directed what was to happen to our goods and the things that we own 
and what, where we wanted de to designate this to go and where we wanted to designate that to go. Now that is a legal document, but it is of not effect unless we are dead because the, 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 the thing that triggers, triggers the testament into law is the death of the testator. And so what Paul is, or what the writer of Hebrews is saying here is that with Jesus, these things were the testament and the figure of things to come. And when Jesus came and fulfilled this law, this became the testament, which was to be in fact, but did not occur until the death of Christ on the cross. Verse 23, now then, we look then, uh, <clears throat> It was therefore necessary the patterns of things in heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves are better sacrificed than these. He talks about the fact that Christ is the perfect picture of the testament that we're talking about, the perfect picture of, of this in, in our life. And said, so, let's look, it says, nor yet should we, verse 25, nor yet should, uh, nor, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. He said, in the past, all of these things took place annually, but now then, of course, Jesus died once. And for then must he have often suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once the end of the world hath appeared to put away sin by sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many unto them that look to him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Now what he is concluding here, he's saying that first of all, these things and all the things in, in the practice of Judaism are a picture of the coming Messiah. These things must take place and are a figure of things to come. And Jesus Christ came to earth and he fulfilled all of these things one after another. And then when he died, the New Testament, his, test, uh, his testament, his law, then set aside the first testament and then came to all of us uh, instead of being an annual process where people were, 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 went through this process annually, Jesus died once. So therefore, how many times was a person be saved? And we've already talked about this. Jesus died once, a person can be saved but once. Once a person is saved, then that is eternal. That lasts forever. For, G for a person to be saved a second time would mean that Jesus would have to leave heaven and come and, and die all over again. But the Bible says that it's appointed unto man once to die. So therefore, there's one salvation. Jesus will only die once. Man will save, be saved only once. There are two births. If there are two births, there's only one death. If there's one birth, there'll be two deaths. The one birth, uh, if a person is born twice, then he is born of a flesh, and then he is born spiritually, that means he's saved, and he's, he's cleansed and made to become a part of this, this process that the, that the writer is describing. So therefore, if we die, if we are born twice, then there's only one death. And then the judgment, of course, which Jesus takes care of our sin. But if we failed, if we are only born once, born physically, then we die, then we will die not only physically, but we will die spiritually as well. And so a person who dies spiritually uh, will be a person who is separated from God forever. And so the, the lost are born once, and will die in the flesh and spiritually. How we are born and how, how our salvation process determines what our eternal security will be like and our eternal presence will be like. I've heard a lot of people say it this way, some, you're gonna live somewhere forever. But I'll say to you that living and being conscious are two different things. You'll be aware of things forever. A person who is who is saved will live forever in heaven. But a person who's lost will be conscious, but will be spiritually dead and separated from God forever. This process, of course, is too horrible to even imagine. 
It is so, it is so bad that a lot of people have rejected it and said that it's not true. But of course, this is the truth that the Lord taught himself. Okay, well, that concludes chapter nine, and I hope I made it plain to you, but there's a lot of things to learn. The thing you've got to understand and keep in mind is that you're keeping the, the, the process that occurred in the Old Testament is the Old Covenant, which was fulfilled by Jesus, who will then take this forward in the New Covenant in a very special way. And so we look then that the church is then made up of people who are saved, who have this Holy of Holies inside, to have the mercy seat with God's presence inside, who have the Holy Spirit inside, who are saved inside, and Jesus has sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat once, and so this person will live forever. And so these people who are called and who are saved will now be able to join together into a church body, and then we're going to start looking at that. Now, the next time in chapter 10, we look at the failure of the old covenant. And so he is, and so the writer's not going to let this go. He is going to hammer it till, till, till. So don't get discouraged in trying to understand it because it's really rather simple if you just believe that and you look at that the writer saying that Jesus replaced the old covenant and has brought into our lives the new covenant. And so therefore, those people who are saved are living under the new, new covenant. The old covenant was a conditional covenant and people did not, uh, did not gain everlasting life from it because the law can't save anybody. All the law can do is point out the need of the people to, for salvation. But those people who are saved then are preserved forever. Until next time, I appreciate you joining us. Uh, of course, our pastor here at Heartland Baptist Church is Brother Dusty Ray. I'm Larry Stovall. Our producer is Brother Sam Ray. And I hope that you'll visit us when the, when the pandemic is over. And, uh, and we, we're meeting now, but uh, you come and hopefully we'll be back to semi-normal pretty quick. You have a good day and thanks again so much for joining us.